Today on the show, we have another throuple based in Texas, just like we are, Triad in Texas. They are based in Austin, Texas, and uh, they uh, are joining us to tell us the story of their throuple and their polyamorous love story. Uh, JC, Kate, and Harley. Uh, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, please tell us, how did you become a throuple? Tell us everything about your, your love story. All right. Well, hi. 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 Hello. Uh, well, I think that... I think the start would be you two because y'all were married before I was yeah. ever in the picture. Yep. Yeah, we met in college. Mm -hmm. That was fifth, no, 18, 2005. 2005. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. however many yeah. years ago that is. Yeah. We have our 15th wedding anniversary coming up end of June. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's nice. Congratulations. Very, 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 thank you. Yeah. We got married very, very young. Um, and we were very monogamous back then. <laughs> like, we had no idea. Were we? Well, well that's true. We? <laughs> yeah. Monogamous. Yeah. 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 So um, I grew up a pastor's daughter, very like conservative evangelical yeah. Christian background, no sex before marriage, yeah. certainly nothing queer. We don't really even know what that word means. <laughs> um, to be queer is essentially to be a drag queen. It's like I never really, yeah. which I mean, I could only aspire to being a drag queen, but it just, it didn't feel like my experience, you know, like as a, as a young, you know, queer girl. So I had no idea that like people, I thought my experience of being attracted to both men and women was what being straight was. Hmm. So it's not that I didn't realize I was queer. It's more that I didn't realize everybody else was straight. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> and I got to college and realized what being straight was. And they're like, no, no, we don't know what that actress's ass looks like offhand. We don't, we don't That's know funny. those things. I love it. And I was like, but it's Laura Croft. You don't. <laughs> your roommate. What? Quite a bit. Why don't you know that? I mean, look at her. And so I uh, very quickly realized everyone else was straight. And, um, but, you know, I, there's this whole escalator to really conservative evangelical backgrounds, and I didn't really know how to get off it. And yeah. Jesse and I had already been dating for two, three years, um, somewhere in that process. And, and I was pretty much in the same boat. Like, yeah, our childhoods were very similar, I mm -hmm. think, in that way. Yeah. Um. And uh, that, I think, shaped a lot of the direction that, like, my late teens, early 20s went. Um, and then mm -hmm. as I, like, dealt with those things, I realized I'd made a bunch of decisions not as freely as I thought I had. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years into our marriage was like, I, you know, it's not you, but I feel really hurt and resentful and, like, I missed out on the chances I should have had, you mm -hmm. know, to date other people to that's very interesting. Out what I really wanted in a partner. Yeah. And I mean, Jesse, bless his heart, was like, well, I never said that, you know, we could only be with each other. I never said those things. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me where right. I thought, okay, we made promises to each other. But, but like, you know, when we talk, think about our wedding vows or whatever, we we, don't, we purposefully kind of, I think, or without maybe meaning to, yeah, maybe more like subconsciously, I think, kind of created uh, promises to each other that, you know, didn't really talk about other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, our relationship had always been about you are special to me, yeah. not no one else will ever be special to mm -hmm. me. And that I think really kickstarted our like polyamory journey was mm. me having the freedom to say, okay, I can figure these things out now. And I don't have to be constrained by what I thought I had to do at 20 and 21. Yeah. Um, and my whole life before that. So, I mean, Jesse really stepped up and like trusted me and mm. we trusted each other a lot. Um, and uh, he was pretty, much letting it be my experience didn't think he really wanted or needed anything outside of you know one partner for for years 
So well, I started, you know, got on dating apps, yeah. started dating other people 2016. And I think it, for you, it wasn't till it wasn't until we moved, moved here to Austin, Austin 20, in 2019. 2020. 2020. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah. yeah. right. move right before That's the true. lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Where'd you guys move from? Um, we, uh, Harley's a uh, lifelong Austin area. I, and we were, we were and, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota before yeah. coming mm-hmm. down to Austin. So. Yep. So very, very Midwestern. Um, went to college in Iowa, lived in South Dakota, and then moved to Austin just kind of for a big life change. One yeah. of which was finding, uh, um, a place where there were more polyamorous people yeah. and mm-hmm. more queer people. And yeah. that was capable of, you know, um, we were capable of being more out with. Yeah. yeah being more yourselves. Yeah. 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 It was part of that whole way of like yeah. starting over and being like, okay, yeah. you know, we're choosing polyamory. We're yeah. going to make this. So you guys know, were we open everything. to each other about what you wanted even though initially yeah. you assume monogamy is the only way mm-hmm. when you started mm-hmm. when you started wanting different things you started communicating and you you worked through it together that's kind yeah. of what i always tell people is like the miracle of how our relationship is still our relationship is that you know we we got together as kids and we grew into adults miraculously in the same direction mm-hmm. because beautiful. we could have so easily gone other ways um, but you know, over the course of, I always like to say like, I don't know, like a dozen road trips across the country, we would always be driving somewhere or other from the Midwest, you know, and we would have these late night discussions of just, you know, everything from philosophy to whatever. And at some point, you know, I think someone was like, well, how, would you ever have a threesome, you know, mm-hmm. and convers- someone, okay, me, <laughs> <laughs> if it was Laura Croft, and we- yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And so, you know, it it just took, it it took a lot of those conversations, but that we did kind of make that evolution together in the end. Wonderful. That's beautiful. That speaks a lot to the relationship that you guys have, that you had a relationship that you could be that open and honest with each other. And yeah, that's, I mean, Josh and I have had that relationship as well. And it's, uh, it's definitely a foundation, an excellent foundation for making that successful transition from being a couple to that's being right. a solid throuple. Yeah. Well, it's always great too when yeah. you see a couple that they grow together. Yeah. You know, instead of growing apart, mm-hmm. you guys yeah. chose to yeah. let's go on this trip together. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's definitely something you do on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a oh, pers- yeah. purposeful decision. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and intentionality made it easier when I came into the picture too. Yeah. Because so 2020, they moved to Austin the week before the lockdown for COVID happened. Wow. And great timing. So <laughs> Kate, and I, Kate and I matched on Tinder um, in April. Mm-hmm. Um, or was it the end of March? It was right at the beginning. Yeah, it was the end of March. Okay, end of March. And then did the like digital COVID dating mm-hmm. for the start of our relationship. I mean, we had like seven hour long Zoom dates. Wow. wow. Um, because I, uh, I was still having to go to work during the lockdown because I worked at the funeral home. And so yeah. it's not like we could shut down or work from home. Yeah. And, <laughs> That's right. so, uh, and then I'm a high risk individual. So like I was being very cautious with like the COVID bubbles at that point in time. Yeah. And I think we had been doing Zoom dates for a little over a month before it came up for meeting in person. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, like it was really just Kate and I forming a relationship. And like um, when I met Jesse, like we focused like on building an intentionally good meta relationship yeah. mm-hmm. like being the three of us wasn't even on the table no. in the beginning um and part of that's because of the other relationships i was in back then mm-hmm. um my now ex-husband uh was not the greatest human i'll just say that and um he put a lot of roadblocks mm-hmm. for me in other relationships and um, we could probably t- do a whole podcast just talking about stories <laughs> from that year yeah that year it was, was messy. wild um yeah. And so when I had left that relationship and then the like door was open for possibility, Mm -hmm. I think Jesse and I both kind of subconsciously realized like there's something there and we might want to explore that. And then I told Kate that I I was like, Kate, I hate this. I think I have a crush on Jesse and I don't know (laughs) what to do about this. And Kate decided to be like, I know something you don't know. (laughs) <laughs> yes. okay. Yeah. So Kate like likes to push the buttons and <laughs> I had just moved in with Kate and Jesse because mm-hmm. of how I was um, nested with my previous partner when we mm-hmm. separated. 
I moved in with them while I was looking for my own place. Mm -hmm. And so I tell Kate this and she starts pushing buttons over the course of us having dinner, hanging out. And that night we ended up playing this truth or dare game I have. And Kate kept making comments and pushing buttons. And finally, Jesse, I think, put all the pieces together. And I had said dare. And he's like, I dare you to kiss me. Oh. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so that is how, <laughs> but that's how our, like, yeah. ex exploration of the three of us, actually, like, yeah. how that door opened. Mm -hmm. And so then after that, we got to kind of talk about what we wanted and, like, how we wanted things to function. And if we wanted to be the three of us or if we wanted to, like, I would date Kate and I would date Jesse, but there wouldn't be like so much of a relationship in the group. And so that was how we kind of got, got started. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kate, how did it make you feel? Uh, the fact that there was uh, more between uh, Jesse's and Harley's relationship. Did you feel any jealousy I mean, at any point? Or were you just happy for them or? I was over the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, to start with, because I finally had some leverage, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, I, I knew about Harley's crush and I, you know, know Jesse's complete and total dating history. So I, I think him saying, I dare you to kiss me was like his boldest, boldest moment ever. <laughs> and, uh, was very proud of him for that. But, um, I think it made a lot of sense to me because I feel like I, I want very certain very specific type of relationship with my partners and lo and behold that attracts a certain type of people mm -hmm. and not that they didn't have you know their own you know gravitational pull on, on each other but they're a lot alike in a in a, some very important ways mm -hmm. so it, it made so much sense to mm -hmm. me that um they would have more than than friendship there um and i think that really simplified a lot of things and like I relationship be a whole entity on its own right um which it would have been anyway but this is kind of like a to a different degree um and that felt really like good and natural it was hard I think Harley and I had been dating eight nine months when that happened and through COVID lots of family disconnection mm -hmm. Um, lots of upheaval in Harley's personal life and in us just having moved and yeah. not telling family about any of this. So right. I didn't have a lot of my supports. I think I was really nervous for a long time that, I don't know, somehow the relationship with a man might be more fulfilling to Harley than, it, than a relationship with a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think that was more mostly my fear of my own queerness not being valid on its own I think that was a mm -hmm. lot of stuff from how I grew up of like oh, okay well women have emotional relationships but that's largely it mm -hmm. and um, I mean of course thank goodness that not turned out to be the case mm -hmm. um, so I think I had a lot of like fears and questions at first but the bigger issue, I think, was just adjusting to change right. and learning how to shift boundaries now that I had a completely different relationship with Jesse and a very mm -hmm. different relationship with Harley than it had been. Yeah. So it wasn't so much jealousy as it was just the speed of how quickly things came together yeah. and all the change that that caused. Yeah, I think yeah. we're very we similar. In, in that mm -hmm. aspect, because we too started as a V dynamic and then we became a throuple. So I think uh, Josh can can relate to that. Yeah, I think. And it's a common story, too. I, we see that a lot mm -hmm. of the uh, throuples we've been interviewing. Also, another commonality that we've recently discovered um, from all the throuples we've been inter interviewing is there's at least always one person in the throuple that came from a very conservative mm -hmm. Christian background. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, at least one. And they're usually wrestling yeah. with some purity culture thing, too. So we just had mm -hmm. a... Um, therapist yesterday that we interviewed all about purity culture. So really excited to release that out because um, yeah, we just keep yeah, seeing that pop up again and again and again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Such a common thread. And there's so many ways, especially I was, I bought into everything much uh, more than Josh or Liv. Josh was raised in very conservative circles as well, but uh, I bought into it so fully and deeply that there are still things that I'm like trying to 
deconstruct and like get rid of yeah. like you were mm-hmm. saying like you, you don't even understand your own queerness like and how that relates to your partners and how you perceive the world and yeah it's it's an important conversation i think to be having in in this realm of non-monogamous mm-hmm. relationships i agree yeah. I mean, well, and I, I was raised Southern Baptist, but I left the church before I was even out of high school. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, and so like, Southern I have, Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> she was like, I'm I not have a lot of, <laughs> we're, no. I'm, the thing about a Southern uh, Baptist a lot is of we don't raise our hands in church unless we're voting out. <laughs> oh, of no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's church. We <laughs> should get it. Church it's, uh, yeah, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Yeah. Um, and by the time I like was in high school, I already had just left having any sort of faith completely. And I, I feel like mm-hmm. that allowed me to kind of explore my queerness and like the, po- like me being polyamorous, mm-hmm. um, a, like a lot earlier. Because I was out as bi before I was even in high school. And Mm. then I was out, like, in college, I realized I identified as pan. And then I came out as a non-binary very recently. Um, But even my, like, high school sweetheart, who I was with for, like, 10 years, he and I had an open relationship. We didn't do it healthy by any means because we were young, dumb kids. But, like, monogamy has, like even that in 17, 18 was something that didn't really work for me or make sense to me. And I think because of having left the church as early as I did, I got the space to explore that a lot earlier. Hmm. Right. And how out are you guys now? Does everybody know about your relationship or only certain people? Like, how do you deal with it? Everybody but your grandfather who knows but doesn't know. Yeah. yeah. And then my (laughs) one person (laughs) and then my very, very Southern Baptist aunt and uncle who I think are just pretending they don't know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and that was quite the process. Like I think uh, coming out as polyamorous to my parents was one of the harder things I'd ever done. Um, and certainly both Kate and I have had roadblocks in that whole journey of like coming out to our family about who we really are, you know, and who, mm-hmm. who uh, we are choosing to be. And um I think we're kind of in a pretty good place right now where, where we've really managed to build some acceptance Mm -hmm. and like we can bring Harley to family get togethers on both sides of our family and have Harley be welcome. Yeah. But that took a lot of sacrifice and like kind of hard work and really like basically putting big boundaries down with family and saying, look, you, we want you to accept this and you're accepting either the three of us or not, or you, you're not getting any of us. Right. And so there was, you know, that, that didn't go across super well either. Right. No one yeah. loves to hear uh, an ultimatum, but uh, I think it was kind of necessary to, to get us to the place where we are now, where people are actually like, like we went to Christmas with my family and people yeah. were really welcoming and it was, they nice. love Harley. Nice. And I, I've made so much progress with your parents and like mm-hmm. that was probably the biggest roadblock for me with your family specifically, Jesse was your parents because Jesse's parents are missionaries that live in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Um, Jesse grew up down there um, because of his fa- his parents moving the entire family down there. And mm-hmm. they they came at it very frequently from a very religious lens and like, yeah. um, we, we won't get to see you in heaven type conversations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we still and, hear some of that. Mm-hmm. And, like, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. But it, it was one of those things where Jesse's dad was much more open to start on just getting to know me as a person. And it has taken a lot of very intentional effort and a lot of conversations between the three of us that had a lot of like tears and hurt and frustration about like, how do we handle this? How do we navigate this? And then this last Christmas, like Jesse's mom, like was welcoming, was friendly, was warm. And it was like mm-hmm. the first family get together that there wasn't any point that it felt like That's this, great. you're the mistress. Yes. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I, Someone's mistress. We're never yeah. sure who's. No, they don't know whether to attribute me, <laughs> Kate or to Jesse. Um, the fact, yeah, that's always, and then Kate's family, like we had a lot, there was a lot of difficult conversations there, but Mm -hmm. her younger sister, um, she had invited the three of us up, um, not just Kate because Jesse had gone and stayed with them for like a month to help with one of their kids, um, who was sick at the time. And, um, Kate and I joined later and by 
that just kind of olive branch of I'm going to invite you and see how this goes. Mm -hmm. That was like the ripple effect that was able to help with almost all Mm -hmm. of the family because she was able to come from a point of view of like, I'm a mom and you know how protective I am. My kids, like my kids adore Harley and like Harley will always be welcome in my home. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of became the advocate within the family where anytime there was like a disagreement or like, feathers ruffled or anything like that Lydia would come around and be like no we're not doing this this is not how our family's gonna work mm-hmm. and nice. so like yeah. because of that like now I go to all the family get-togethers like we just did a very very late Christmas dinner with Kate's mom um and like exchanged gifts and everything and it was good and like the families have finally kind of settled there's yeah. still a couple of people on both sides that just right yeah yeah I always come have around, those few but, people <laughs> Yeah, but, but for the most part, my family, I'm disconnected from most of my family, but the parts of my family I do talk to, everyone was like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. Like, they're family right. now. They're cool. Awesome. And for other throuples that are still scared to come out, do you guys feel like, even though it was hard, it's all worth it? For us, for me, absolutely. I'm very close to my family and especially my siblings and my mom. Um, and that's been at like, hard one like vulnerability and time and healing and communication you know we grew up in a like a super abusive household Mm -hmm. finally got you know away from my dad and we're all just determined to have good relationships with each other and be in each other's lives Mm -hmm. and I just couldn't stomach the thought of having to have two different separate lives right and um if that is the case for anybody else it's absolutely worth it and yep. you really have to trust yeah. people who love you and you have to show up and love them even when they're not loving you. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that was the biggest piece for both of y'all is even when your family would like be hostile or mm-hmm. like be speaking from hurt or like mm-hmm. misinformation or any of these other lenses that were being applied, you two still showed up and were like, I love you and this is important to me and you are important to me, which is why I am telling you this. Mm -hmm. And it never became a battle of, well, you're rejecting me. It was always like, I'm going to show up with compassion and grace and loving and hope you will find your way to me there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sit there in the living room and weep while your sister says things Mm -hmm. that break your heart and still have to say, be gentle, you know, and Mm -hmm. say, please remember who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still the same person. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, y'all did draw boundaries about like these, you can't continue saying these things yeah. to me. Like, it's not like you just took the verbal no. abuse by no. any means, but like gently setting a boundary and gently enforcing the boundary while still having compassion yeah. and like love for the person, I think is why y'all were able yeah. to make so much progress. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. And it was both, it was harder than I thought and it took longer than I thought, but it was also faster and easier than I thought. <laughs> like a really funny story there amid all the, is this really going to be worth it was telling my brother who I'm quite close to, but we're such, we have very similar values, but they show up in our lives in very different ways. He is a a Republican farmer in Ohio with four little girls (laughs) and several hundred acres and a bunch of cattle and his own machine shop. And um, very much in the vein of how we grew up. And when I finally told him, he was like, well, you're still my sister. Honestly, I thought you'd been sleeping with women for years. <laughs> I was like, what? And he was like, well, your friend, Lynn, you've always been so excited when she came down to visit. And I was like, That's funny. We're just friends. <laughs> and so he was like, we'd been assuming for a long time. And Amy and I talked like, what if, what if this new person we're hearing about is like a serious thing? And they had decided, he just, he just said, well, if nobody else is going to make a deal out of it, then we're not either. Mm-hmm. Whoever you love is yeah. probably, you know, mm-hmm. worth having around the kids. So that's, yeah. that's fine. And, and just, he and Harley can talk about motorcycles all day long. And so cars. Works, yeah, works they get along great. Yeah. And that just shocked me to no end. Yeah. And was just, it really gives people the opportunity to surprise you with right. how, open and loving they can be and how much they really do love you. Yeah. That's awesome. It's we found that easy. too when we were living in Northern California, we're very close to the Bay Area. It was like we would we tell people and we like we could tell somebody that was a very conservative right wing person. We're like putting their heads down like, oh, you know, just gonna start a huge fight. They're like, oh that's cool. 
Yeah, like it, it, it didn't phase them. I always knew you were going to pull yeah. that one. Yeah, and then you would tell <laughs> to a liberal that you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I think the, you know, and they'd be like, why doesn't she have two men? <laughs> yeah. You're like, uh, Northern I, California, yeah. it's it's a little shocking the, the responses that you get there. <laughs> it's yeah. strange, please. Yeah. It's very different uh, here in Houston. They don't. Nobody seems to care here. They're just like you could tell them anything. They're like, whatever works yeah. for you. <laughs> Yeah. That's not uh, for me, but yeah. You guys, so you guys and, just recently celebrated uh, three years as a triad. So congratulations! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saw that online. Yeah. Um, do you feel that it's the consistency of that that helped with the relationships with your family? Like they got yeah. to see yeah. it over a long enough timeline. It wasn't a phase That's or a fad or. Yeah. Well, because there was a lot of those comments in the beginning about like, well, what happens when this this fizzles out or what happens when you get over this and don't want to do it anymore? Um, it or was, is Harley going to steal Jesse away from Kate or yeah. some combination of those? Oh, right? Well, I was going to say, your, uh, Kate's family was actually more worried that I was going to steal Kate from you. And yeah. they were more concerned <laughs> about losing you and the family. Yeah. Mm, yeah. They, thought, uh, they would lose me somehow. Um, and sad. so the consistency definitely alleviated those concerns in a lot of ways. And because of the fact that I'm now going to family functions and like showing up for the holidays, showing up for family weddings, all of those things, they get to see how we interact and how we exist together and like what the dynamic of our relationship is. And I think they're able to see that it is a serious, like long-term relationship, mm -hmm. that there's no, there's no phase there. That's right. awesome. How quickly did you guys come out? Uh, uh, after becoming a triad, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, well, I, well, I mean, I just came out to my grandparents on my dad's side over Christmas. Yeah. So but it's still kind of in process. But I was going to say the summer vacation with Jesse's family, y'all told yeah. Jenna and Sean and them. Yeah. So and that parents. was, so that was July of 2021. So that mm -hmm. would have been like six months later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had a good, yeah, a good six months together before we really said anything about it. Um, yeah. you know, COVID was still going on. It wasn't really, um, as much, there was less concrete reason it needed to be now. And so I think we were just building our relationship and that makes sense. letting that be private. But then yeah. we had several grandparents die and, yeah. um, cousins get married and the first, you know, kind of quote unquote, post COVID, you know, family vacations and holidays. And it just felt. Um, we wanted really to be a part of it. Uh, yeah, unethical for us to like, like, I'm not going to leave for our first Christmas right. as a triad, yeah. you know, second Christmas with my girlfriend ever, I'm not leaving them at home. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. leave me at home if that's the choice. Yeah. So we're like, okay, we've, we've got to integrate. So it's been a, it's been a, a revolving mm -hmm. and long process, but. Speaking about integration, uh, do you guys, uh, Jesse and Kate, do you feel like you had to do any uncoupling when you became a throuple? Hmm. Like break any any rule, like not break, but dismantle any rules and things that you had just as a couple now so you can become a throuple? Well, we did change some plans. Yeah. Harley is like yeah. very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we changed the way some things were working, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, a big part of that was even when Kate started dating and then later I did a little bit of dating and just that did not go well. Um, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, we, we, you know, finances had to work a little differently. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, Kate was like, well, am I paying for your dates? Are you paying for my dates with, cause we used to just share all the finances. Everything was fully integrated and we kind of moved more towards a, everyone has their own. Mm, I don't know, pillar of finance within the, the mm -hmm. triad eventually. But, you know, even the when it started, it was just me and, and Kate. We, you know, divided things up a little bit. I think the biggest thing, aside from, you know, some logistical things like separating finances a little, you know, talking through privacy spaces in the house, um, was learning how to communicate a little bit differently. Because when you have, you know, a partner of like, 10, 15 years, you, I tell Jesse everything, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about everything. Oh my gosh, I went on this date with this amazing person. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's getting more serious. They said this, look at this text. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. Oh no, the date went, you know, went <laughs> weird. Tell me yeah. how much should I freak out about this? <laughs> um, and 
that works to a point. Yeah. But then there's a point where you're like, oh, well, this is a real relationship that deserves privacy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so then you have to sort of start saying, well, we have to think about how we talk about these things yeah. differently. That's and especially when yeah. we talk about us. having an episode about how much do you share? How much is oversharing? Yeah. How, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that like my like, setting my own boundaries was part of what was helpful in that process was like, this is what I am comfortable being common common knowledge amongst the three of us. And these are things I would rather be private within the relationships Mm -hmm. because they're like, when you have one relationship there, one relationship here, one relationship Mm -hmm. there. And then the fourth is the three of us. You kind of have to discuss and set boundaries for each of those relationships and how it's going to function with information sharing and like overlap and things like that. Yeah, and that yeah. is something that yeah, really so that changes helps. from one, to, yeah, one individual to another. What was that, Kate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying. I think that really helped because Jesse and I were like, okay, so where do we start? And Harley was like, okay, how about this as a starting point? Right. And mm-hmm. we're like, oh, does that work? Let's try yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important that it be like a fluid process too. Mm-hmm. You know it as your relationships change, as you get closer, as you grow apart or, you know, together, um, those things are going to change too. Mm -hmm. And being able to have, you know, some flex in those things was really nice because we could just hear each other and go from that rather Mm -hmm. than anybody else's strict rule or principle of what should or shouldn't be Mm -hmm. shared. You're right. Yeah, that's a it's a main uh, quality that you have to have to be polyamorous and be in a trouble. Just be flexible. Mm-hmm. If you're very rigid, mm-hmm. it's not going to yeah. work out. So it sounds like your guys' trouble happened organically. Like you weren't looking to be in a trouble. Is that right? Mm-mm. Yeah, and no. then you right. uh, no. you guys have been no. trailblazing it because there's not really a manual. But like this is how you do it. So you guys have been no. just figuring it out on your own. Were you able to find any resources or anything along the way that helped you? Uh, good therapists. Yeah, very good um, And I've been mm. especially lucky with mine because she has a lot of thoughts on how polyamory tends like there there can be so much pop psychology about it mm. that in can overemphasize um, toxic positivity. <laughs> it, yeah, just yeah. like, oh, everything's awesome. This is never going to be hard, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, get off the monogamy train. Life is beautiful. Um, which, yes, but, you know, intention with other things, intention with real life and yeah. your own histories. But also a lot of the resources we found can be very, um, like, collectivist or very, like, individual. And, like... Um, encouraging people to assert I'm my own island or encouraging people to assert, you know, we're all part of a collective pattern Mm -hmm. and finding your own balance there, I think is really important. So that was one Mm -hmm. thing I think we struggled with, with a lot of short form online um, resources was identifying what perspectives they were coming from Mm -hmm. and what like central values they Mm -hmm. had and then figuring out, is that also my value? Mm -hmm. Well, I think finding re- like resources that didn't focus on any problem is because you need to unpack your ingrained monogamy. Mm-hmm. Because so many of like the resources focus on, well, if you're feeling that it's just jealousy and you need to unpack that and you mm-hmm. need to do the work there. And so frequently that's, that's not so black and white. Like, right. yes, there could be, like <laughs> yeah, yes, it could be some ingrained monogamy, but it could also be that there's communication breakdowns happening and you need to talk through it or that there's something that is like incompatible with the situation and that needs to be addressed. And I feel like a lot of the resources are like, just, just take a jackhammer to it, just get through it. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think with that is the other struggle that like the therapist for me filled in um, because my therapist is wonderful. She uh, very polyamory informed, but then we also did things like poly secure, right? Like talking about attachment, like attachment trauma and like any of the books from like, psychiatrists that are about attachment trauma really help because Mm. it really digs into like why patterns show up. And I think for all three of us, that was helpful because we can see like, oh, that's kind of being a bit avoidant. What's like triggering that for you? Like what's causing that? Like, how do we address that? Or, oh, it feels like you're kind of anxious attachment right now. Like what's going on? What can we do? And so I think all of us talking through that and like doing 
research into that helped all of us yeah. because when you come from a religious background, you don't usually get out of that no. boat without any attachment trauma at all. Oh yeah, no. Um, yeah. And sort of from a more foundational perspective, um, when Kate and I were first starting to think, oh, what is polyamory? Or not even that, we were just thinking, you know, could someone date someone else other than their husband or, or partner or whatever? Um, we read together Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory. Yep. Right? That was, that, yep. that was, that was, that was a Smart Girl's Guide to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and that was really helpful. Yeah, Just it was basic concepts and like helping us like with the terminology and things like that. And yeah. it, it was pretty balanced from, um, yeah, it was, um, kind of like a collection of reflections and experiences and talking through, you know, pros and cons of just different facets of polyamory, um, then I was also going to recommend Polysecure too. I was just, I could not remember the title of it. So I looked it up, but yeah. Uh, Polysecure by Jessica Fern is like research-based attachment trauma driven um, breakdowns of like the issues that can happen. And, you know, I assume you guys have heard of the book too, because it's one yes. of, I think the, the first resources out there mm -hmm. that takes that approach to it. And it's a, it's hands down my first, book recommendation for anybody who wants to learn more or deal with issues from a, a healing perspective when it comes to polyamory. I yeah. think my other resource that I relied on heavily pre-COVID, so pre-knowing them, was the polyam community here in Austin. Mm -hmm. There were there were meetups, there were groups, and like so I could show up and find other people in the community and like build those connections where you can be like, hey, if you were in this situation, what would you do? Or like, how did you handle this situation? I saw you go through it and like you can kind of pick and choose the advice, right? Like what will work for you because mm -hmm. it's not one size fits all, but like yeah. there are some things that just kind of come up regularly in those conversations that you're like, okay, this is probably a pretty good like standard to be aware right. of. Yeah. That, that's amazing because yeah, like, this I, is something that I miss from uh, when we lived in Sacramento, there was a huge polyamorous community there. Yeah, and uh, uh, moving here in Houston, not so much. And I feel like I missed that. So uh, how is life as polyamorous, as being polyamorous in Austin? Is it uh, rewarding? Do you feel like you have a lot of people around <laughs> you? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I have really appreciated is um, even in joining new communities here in Austin, it's never been an issue that it's the three of us. Right. We've never had a problem meeting people and being like, there's three people here. There are yeah. three relationships here. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, okay, cool. Three of y'all. Awesome. Let's keep mm. going. And even outside yeah. the polyamory community, that's been pretty consistent, which has been nice. Yeah. Um, I can go into like a work situation, some, sh some uh, video shoot somewhere and generally be open about the triad and everyone's like, cool. Awesome. Like, I have not had any negative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Good, good. Yeah, we, we like Austin uh, and uh, we are actually thinking about moving there. So, yeah, we yeah. were there and we had a great I, time. I was like, it, it, would work. it was very familiar to Sacramento to me. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's amazing. Like. It's, the cost of living just is awful. <laughs> yep, <laughs> we heard that. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, like, so I've been a huge soccer fan my entire life. I played growing up till I got an injury and couldn't play anymore. And soccer spaces have been traditionally space I was not comfortable in being femme presenting, being queer, being anything other than like this very specific box. Because mm -hmm. like Houston and Dallas soccer communities for um, like their teams is very can be very toxic, like toxic masculinity. They're homophobic a lot of times like it's it's problem. Mm -hmm. And then when Austin got a team, I was like dipping my toes in the water because I was like, I don't want it to be the same. And when I joined the supporters group, I was like cautious to say it. And then I found other polyamorous people who were open in the community. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I don't know why I was concerned. Mm -hmm. And like everyone now, if I show up somewhere, mm -hmm. they're like, where are Kate and Jesse? Like, mm -hmm. where are your people? Mm -hmm. And like, they, like, I wrote an opinion piece for the Austin Chronicle about my experience as being welcomed into a soccer community. And I say that like, they accepted me as a non-binary queer polyamorous person and like, I had so many people come up and be like, I always like, I'd never actually talked to you. I kind of wondered if they, they were both your partners, but I wasn't really <laughs> sure. But like, I'm glad you brought them along. Like, it was a them. really cool experience here. I love how open and just free you guys all are with like in your careers and everything. And then we haven't mentioned it yet, but Kate, you are an author also helping to promote and normalize alternative relationship structures. You want to tell our listeners about yeah. your 
works? Yeah, sure. I would love to. Um, I write young adult fiction um, under my, you know, actual name, Kate Browning. And I have two books out right now. Um, and the most recent one, Ballad of Dinah Caldwell, features a polyamorous relationship. I mean, I don't use that language at all. Um, really, mm -hmm. it's just a girl going through a lot of grief and upheaval and figuring out how to love again, really. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's very, I, it's very exciting. It's very cool. It's like a young adult true grit, if that's your jam or um, the uh, Mumford and Sons song, Dust Bowl Dance, uh, gender flipped and set in the future. Yep. <laughs> uh, so if, if that's your jam, you know, like I wanted it to be something aside from a polyamorous romance and it didn't like, as I was drafting it for a long time, it, it didn't, have polyamory in it but as I got to know the characters more and as I got to know myself more I realized you know I don't want her to have to make the choice between her past life or her present life and the future she wants I think mm -hmm. she's lost so much I don't want her to just have more pointless loss mm -hmm. so if there's two people she loves why am I gonna throw this awful choice at her that is going to you know break at least half of her heart yeah. when there's no real reason to do that. Um, that. So she, by the end of the book has is um, with a guy and she's also with her longtime best friend, spoiler, but with queer things, with polyamory <laughs> things, I believe in spoiling it, yeah. you know, you yeah. want to know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. And in young adult fiction specifically, that that's really important to me because I think we don't consider teenagers to be fully individual people a lot, mm -hmm. um, just culturally. Mm -hmm. We're afraid of them being influenced and oh, we're afraid that they're going to be polluted somehow. And I don't think questions harm people. It's static answers that do a lot more harm than pointing someone to a question. So mm -hmm. What, that's one of the things I, I really love doing is setting out questions that I wish I had been able to articulate for myself as a kid. That's you know, right. what, yeah. what does good sex look like? What does a bad relationship look like? What does a good relationship feel like? What happens if it's good, but it's not all you want? You know, what happens if you go through huge loss and now your relationship is changing, even if you don't want it to. Um, is it okay to just try, try something on for size? Mm -hmm. Do you have to be serious about it all the time? And provide a space for people to look at those questions more so than hand them answers. And I, th I think that's one of the most important things I could be doing with my life. This That's is why beautiful. you're the, you, you can tell she's the author in the family. I mean, she's the deep <laughs> thinker. That's yes, sure. I, I can definitely oh, I tell know. that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, I love it. So I've seen this, like the few polyamorous movies out there or books, they have this pattern where uh, the, uh, the main character tries polyamory. And then at the end, they're like, you know what? That's really not for me. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I just, I don't like that. It sets this like, okay, yeah, maybe we could dream about it, but that's not real life and it's not reality. And I better be the good girl or the good guy and just go back to monogamy. And I love that your book is different. Good job. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, that's one of my favorite things about polyamory, actually. I mean, to personalize it even more is that you, you know, I didn't even realize there was kind of a traditional escalator um, to relationships and what love and like fulfillment looks like. And then once you find polyamory, it's so new, there's so few resources, there's often so little support that, um, you know, like you said earlier, you're kind of blazing the trail. Mm -hmm. Even though polyamory has been around since as long as people have been around, right? We're just, mm -hmm. we're not shown it and it's not right. like scaffolded for us. So we don't really know what our options are. And that kind of allowed me to, almost start over as a person and mm -hmm. think about why do I want each of these things? Do I still want to be married? Do I still want um, relationships to look this way? 
And that's not a choice you get offered very often. You're right. In in monogamy is yes. what do I want this to be? And in polyamory, that's the only question, you know, just about is what do I want this to be? Yep. And that's why we're here. Yeah. You, your books, our podcast mm -hmm. offer that information and the fact that there is another choice. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we will link Kate's book in the show notes if you, any of our listeners are interested in getting that book for themselves. I definitely am interested. Yes. I'm going to go read that book. Thank you. Yes. It's a fun but, read. Yeah. It's a, it's a like revenge thriller. It's a lot of fun. Revenge thriller. Nice. That's one of my favorite kind. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I got to read the book ahead of it being released because I did a sensitivity read for motorcycle content because there's mm -hmm. a lot of scenes that involve a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And like, I, it took me what, mm -hmm. like two days to get you your notes back because I had read yeah. the entire thing. It was just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> so cool. It is very much a balls to the wall, 17 year old girl sets off to like kill a dude. So, <laughs> nice. you know, it's perfect. It, it, if angry ladies with big knives is your thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds exciting. <laughs> I saw, so your post that you guys did recently about um, being together now for three years, celebrating that, and you put on there three years of travel, navigating family events, forming entangled lives, adopting dogs, showing up for each other, date nights. Can you guys give that in a summary? What's the summary of your guys' last three years together? <laughs> um, so I wrote that post and that was the best summary I could do. <laughs> um, so, cause I mean, it, it, it really feels like there was so much more than three years over the last three years because of yeah. how much we have filled in. Like we rented a house together in April of 2021 and like that, cause I had moved in temporarily. Um, and then we realized that we wanted to be the three of us and that we worked well living together. Yeah. And so we rented a house and moved in together and then we fostered dogs. We fostered three puppies this summer. I have yeah. had two surgeries in the time we've been together Kate and I spent uh, almost two full months in the UK and Ireland. Mm -hmm. We've done countless road trips. We bought an RV and like have been doing RV trips life. with us and the dogs. <laughs> yeah. um, like, so it's just, it's so hard to summarize it yeah. because it really like. Every three months feels like a whole new era. Yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. We just, it's good. Good. It's great. It's wild. Yeah. But it, sometimes it's, it's hard to keep track yeah. of it all. Yeah. yeah. But hard things too. Like we've lost a yeah. number of grandparents mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. We've mm -hmm. had some family members be like very sick and need, you know, live in support mm -hmm. um, for multiple months of those, those three mm -hmm. years. Um, and we've dealt with the family members who are just, mm -hmm. you know, shitty mm -hmm. to us. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's that too. Well, and then I, so I have, um, I'm in the process of getting an official diagnosis for uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, which is a connective tissue disorder. And I frequently have like joint dislocations and things like that. And mm -hmm. in 2022, my lower back and like my hips and joints started really like progressing into problems. Mm. And so that's been a whole nother layer of us having mm. to navigate, like what does disability mean and how do we navigate doing the things we want to do in a way that is accessible to me? Mm. Um, because last year I had a spinal fusion and SI joint fusion and I had surgery on my foot and I'm looking at probably three more surgeries in the next two years. Wow. And so like, mm. how, how do we navigate that? How, how do we handle that? What do we do? So that's, that's like, it's not all been good, but we've right. found ways to like navigate through all of it. Yeah. We we tackle those challenges together. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's more support, right? You, you feel like there's yeah. more support yeah. being the three of you rather than just two. And all the logistics and all the family issues and all that aside, like the main, the biggest reason I would never leave the triad of uh, philosophy behind again is that the three of us can support each other better than two of us can. Yeah. There's just more support there to go yeah. around. And that's just gotten us through stuff that we would have really struggled with otherwise mm -hmm. over the last few mm -hmm. years. I think it's so, it's so close to, this is going to sound weird, but go with me. <laughs> the way I feel about my siblings or Jesse's siblings. Yeah. When you live in like a big multi-generational family house, or you have that kind of very connected family relationship, mm -hmm. it is so much more support, right? You can go to your sister's closet and grab the little black dress because yours is still in the laundry and um, your uh, sister doesn't like video games. So you can play them with your brother right. and there's always somebody up at 2 AM that you can, you know, if you're having a panic attack or 
you uh, saw something on the internet, you just have to share with somebody. Um, you there's there's more family there. Yeah, you want and, to get away for the weekend, but someone's got to watch the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think like we intentionally tried to build a very like family oriented dynamic within our household mm -hmm. um, because like Kate and Jesse both come from larger families. Mm -hmm. um, like Jesse's family Christmas frequently has like 45 people in the house for Christmas because it's his mom's siblings and all their family and all the kids and everyone gets together like everyone enjoys being together. Like it, for me, it was a very weird family dynamic to walk into because I'm like, why is there no fighting? Why are there no arguments? What's happening? Why does everyone like each other? Mm -hmm. um, and then Kate, you're one of five siblings. And yeah. um, then there's me. I was an only child. Um, and like at a very young age, like in my early twenties, I actually cut ties with most mm -hmm. of my biological family because of just the situation there. And so for all of us, for various reasons, like family is something that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so when we were like looking at building our lives and like actually like creating what we wanted, I think all of us focused on building a family dynamic. So it's, it's support, it's showing up for each other, it's choosing each other. And I think yeah. that was what was mm -hmm. most important to all of us. Right. Even when you don't feel chosen yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because jealousy does happen, right? Yeah. Like things like that. Mm -hmm. you can. Yeah crop yeah. up and get in the way yeah. day to day well and like i think we all approach it as jealousy isn't a bad thing the only way it becomes a bad thing is if you don't handle it well mm -hmm. so if right. you come to the table and say hey i'm feeling jealous and like i have this need that i feel like it's not being met what can we do like that is completely like how we handle it um right because jealousy is going to happen it's a natural emotion absolutely and yeah it it's it's not a bad thing. Like it usually is a, your, your body telling you that there's something you need to pay attention to and uh -huh. something that there's a need not being met. And like, it's kind yeah. of that flag, like, Hey, pay attention to yourself, mm -hmm. take care of yourself. I don't know. What, rem I don't remember where I first heard it, but um, I, I heard that once that jealousy is a flashlight. I think it was in career advice for authors actually. Mm -hmm. And I just love that so much because if you stop trying to, end jealousy or suppress jealousy or be ashamed of it you can look at what it is and it it's like harley was saying for me it helps so much to think of jealousy as a flashlight because it's going to shine a light on something that you need mm -hmm. and it can point you to i need more trust i need more stability i yes. need more reassurance i need something so like and there's nothing it. wrong with it mm -hmm. yeah yeah is we talk about it all the time how it's it's a negative, we consider it to be a negative emotion and we try to run away from it, but that's, we should not do that. It's something like you're saying, the flashlight, it's telling us that we need something and we need to communicate about something. And uh, once you deal with it, you are so much happier, so much better off. Yeah. And it brings more stability and connection in the throuple relationship or any relationship for that matter. Yeah. 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 I have uh, one more question. This is my question. I ask every throuple that I meet. <laughs> this question do you guys sleep together all the time no no when you sleep um, do you ever sleep together yeah and when you do who sleeps okay. in the middle it revolves rotation yeah, yeah. okay perfect um, and i can so ask all three of you the person <laughs> who sleeps in the middle where do you keep your things your phone your water bottle whatever it is that you need where do you keep it i'm the one who sleeps so, in the middle and i don't know where to keep uh -huh. my stuff <laughs> I want so to know if we, you guys invented something. We have a bit of a unique situation because yeah. the house we rented, we made sure that there was th three bedrooms and Kate's bedroom is the like nice. um, the owner's like room with the connected bathroom, but it's also very big. So we got two queen size beds and pushed them together to create mega bed. So mega bed holds all yeah. three of us plus all, all four like, over 40 pound dog, the dogs, dogs can fit on the bed. <laughs> yeah. And so we, for where the person in the middle puts their stuff frequently, it's like on the nightstand or like the headboard behind, but yeah, it's never, an, in, never an issue because of the fact there's so much room. No one's in the way if you need to get to it mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and no one gets stuck because we use multiple blankets. So everyone can get in and out of the bed without yes, having to that's like, what that's what we do. <laughs> what do you do about the crack and, in the, down the middle of the mega bed? You fall in it. That's well, it. I, knew so, it. I knew it. We said it. Well, RD the thing is, like we had well, we had a wedge that went in the yeah. middle to block it. They they have something. 
because when you put two twin beds together to create a king, yeah. mm -hmm. um, they have a thing you can put in the middle that like fills that in yeah. and smooths it over. The problem was one of the dogs destroyed it and yeah. we never yeah. replaced it. But I actually kind of like sleeping on the crack because yeah. I can put my shoulder into it and then my shoulder doesn't dislocate while I'm sleeping. Yeah. So like it's, it actually enough. works for me. Yeah. And the same here, like as a side sleeper, sometimes I just roll into that crack and like, I just kind of settle in. I'm like, you know what? This is fine. There you go. This works. <laughs> I hate the crack. Yeah. yeah, Kate doesn't. Yeah, Kate you're doesn't probably like the it. one who's in the middle of the least for that reason. Yeah, yeah. but I'm that's with okay. Kate, that's I would never your room. Room. Yeah. Track situation. Yeah. Well, but the thing is, like, um, and too, like, I we all like Jesse had his room, I had my bedroom, and then Kate had the room with mm -hmm. mega bed, and so that became kind of the like when all three of us are going to pile into bed together, like that's where we go. Right. But like, I don't co sleep well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really like sleeping in beds with people. I am a super light sleeper. I need to be able to move when I'm like, mm -hmm. my body becomes uncomfortable. Like, and so I kind of hate sleeping in a bed with yeah. other people. Yeah. And so more often than not, I sleep in my own room, the mm -hmm. exception being date nights for the individual couple. And then when we do like the three of us, right. I'll sleep in whoever's room or wherever we're all sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was kind of a dynamic we had to like figure out because like, I just don't like co-sleeping. I would right. rather starfish in my own bed and <laughs> <laughs> not have anyone near me. Mm -hmm. I do have one slightly off topic uh, question for Jesse. Mm -hmm. My eyesight's no old, worries. but from the little tiny screen, I think I see a Star Wars necklace. Is that correct? Oh, oh God. Uh, Good eye. Well, you were going to say, I also have BB-8 right here. There we go. So I fell Star Wars nerds in the house. <laughs> yep. All right. So, so here's the question. Okay. Did uh, Han shoot first? Oh, that's a, that's a fun one. Um, <laughs> I like the special editions, um, but I do think that making Han not shoot first was one of the worst changes. That's <laughs> right. That's what I preach every day. Yeah. So side note, I have been tattooed since I was 17. Um, I have lots and lots of tattoos. Kate and Jesse had never had any mm -hmm. tattoos. And so on May the 4th, one of the tattoo shops in Austin does a Star Wars splash special for May the 4th. And I was like, do y'all want to go with me? Because I was planning on getting me a tattoo. Did yeah, not anticipate yeah. them wanting tattoos. But I was like, y'all can come along and hang out. I've been thinking about it for ages. It was just right time needed to happen. Yeah. yeah. And so we show up to a Star Wars splash day and all three of us walked out with Star Wars tattoos. <laughs> yeah, That's awesome. <laughs> That's yeah. nice. I need some more. I love it. How fun. Yeah, we uh, before we met Liv, when the first three movies came out, we Shar and I used oh. to get uh, invitations to down in Hollywood to go to one of those premieres the night before, but you had to dress up, and we'd mm -hmm. always go all out. At, you know, you, there's like a hotel uh, get together ahead of time or whatever. There'd be a costume contest, and we won the hot yeah, costume a parade contest. from the hotel yeah. over to the theater, like yeah. all in costume. It was so fun. We had our daughter with us when she was uh, little and dressed uh, up as a little Ewok. Yeah, and she got front page of the newspaper. It was fun. The Star Wars thing has been like a long running. Like I've become a fan out of necessity. You had <laughs> yeah. forced into it. Same. There was no, there was no choice. There's when that Mandalorian Polyamory. stuff came out, I yeah. loved it. But then that, all these little shows they've done since there, it's like, eh, what is this? You know, the hot. The... There's, you know, you have to be a diehard fan who reads all the little extra bits, you know, and collects the novels to to really get the the new shows. I think, but I'm. What can I say? Yeah. I, uh, do when you get to the level that you're doing the coloring books, that's uh, that's when you push it too far. You know. <laughs> to be honest, I wouldn't say the lifelong journey has been polyamory. It's been Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real more, more more the thing. Yeah, I do have a bookshelf of just Star Wars, stuff, and that's so. after like four, four moves. It used to be more. Well. Like 80 novels. You were really disappointed when we moved into the new house. And I was like, I want to do a Star Wars kitchen. And Jesse's like, yes, let's do the Star Wars kitchen. Star Wars and Kate's like, that would be bad no. House. I was like, what about Breaking Bad? Can no. I not have my cook's kitchen? They were like, no. 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 It's TIE Fighters and Leia. And, and BB-8. And, and then all of that water color artwork I have. Mm -hmm. and so out of the original canon, uh, what, which is the best film? Oh, okay. So you're talking like not like everything before the sequel trilogy. Yep. Um, yes. My favorite is The Return of the Jedi. I think Empire is probably a better film, but I 
I'm just the sucker for space battles and the space battle in Return of the Jedi is my favorite part. I always of- say the same because everybody oh, says oh. Empire and I say blasphemy because you get Leia in a gold bikini. <laughs> well, well, how can you beat that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is a fun time. It is hard to beat that. <laughs> From a feminist critique <laughs> angle, though, did she want that gold bikini and should we be celebrating it? I mean, she, she <laughs> defeated the villain while wearing it so yeah. and she made That's a lot true. of money i don't i think carrie fisher <laughs> yeah. was it's very rich yeah. 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 guys thank you so much for for joining us on our episode today uh again we learned so much every time we speak to uh thruple we learn so much yes thank you this has been so great do you guys uh, have any advice for thruples just starting out oh goodness yeah, do it <laughs> you know yeah. i yeah, I get, think, get yeah. drunk and play truth or dare. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> not the plan. It works for us, but I feel like that's not going to be a tried and true strategy. I, I'd say take it slow and don't force it to be something it's not. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, very much so. I, I think that's one of the things that worked so well for me and Jesse is we had 2016 to 2020 to go on dates, get rid of one penis policies, think you know about what having me having a girlfriend would would really mean grow up a little change together more and and there's there's no rush you know and um i think moving slow can allow for growing pains to settle yeah. and i think moving slow also allows for the conversations you need to have because if you're like even if each person is coming in as like individuals and it is a new triad where there was no existing relationships there's still gonna have to be conversations about boundaries and then with existing dynamics shifting to the new, like you have to go slow enough that you can actually take the time for those conversations and give them the space they need to make sure you are not setting yourself up for situations where there's going to be more hurt than necessary. Mm-hmm. Wise advice. And just uh-huh. know what you want and why. I think that's the primary thing that time allows for. Yeah. And that was that was huge for me. Uh, are you guys part of our Facebook Facebook group? We have a Facebook group for Thrupples. No. And, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it's called uh, Thrupple Talks Connection Hub. We would love to have mm-hmm. you guys there. You can give yeah. advice to other people awesome. that are starting out on the Thrupple journey. We would really appreciate it. It's really great. We have a yeah. lot of Thrupples yeah. in there now. And it's the, there's nothing else like it. So it's yeah. the one place where we can all like, hey, what do you do about this? And, oh, that we just put two mattresses together. And Yep. yep. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome because so much of like polyamory community is often like relationship anarchist people who are that which is fine which is great but it's like very different kind it of is. polyamory than what we practice and so mm-hmm. it can be hard to find a place mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. yeah no, that's cool awesome we'd love to have you there yes. thank you so much again yeah thank, thank you guys thank it's you. been great talking to you oh, oh, this is so fun <laughs> if right. you like our episodes uh, please subscribe and share them with people just like yourselves And please join us at the Thruple Talks Connection Hub on Facebook. And we'll see you next time.